a total volume of about 2 trillion Naira transactions valued at 263.78 trillion Naira or recorded in the first six months of 2020 as data on electronic payment channels in the Nigerian banking sector show. The National Bureau of Statistics, MBS, disclosed this in its Selected Banking Sector Data Report for the second quarter, which was released on Wednesday. In the report, online transfer transactions dominated the volume of transactions recorded. The MBS disclosed that 1.317 billion volume of online transfer transactions valued at 72.25 trillion Naira are recorded in the second quarter of 2020. In terms of credits to the private sector, the total value of credits allocated by the bank stood at 18.82 trillion Naira as of the second quarter of 2020. We're now being joined by an economist, Bolaho Olotiede. Thank you for joining us on the program. Yeah, thanks for having me. So are you impressed with this figure as a booster for cashless campaign? Um, it's, it's, uh, we're in the right direction with, uh, with the cashless environment. And this is what we all expect. Uh, this is what we all want. I, I, I would like to believe that. And uh, COVID has helped tremendously to also support that initiative uh, because uh, there, there is a, the segment of the society that are not really tapped in into the cashless environment, but COVID seems to have forced everybody's hands to start looking in that direction. Um, that's, that's, that is that with uh, the, 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 the number. Mm. Indeed, the COVID-19 pandemic is a major factor responsible for this, but do you think the figure will drop as soon as the lockdown eases further? No, that's very unlikely. Um, and, and the reason is because even before COVID, the number of transactions on the electronic uh, uh, platform have been on the increase since we started using the electronic platform in this country. If you check the numbers, Month on month, year on year, it had continued to grow. Mm -hmm. uh, COVID might have uh, fast tracked a little bit during this uh, period of uh, COVID. But what, what, what is certain is that once people tasted electronic banking, going back to the branch to go and queue up for certain transactions is totally out of their way. They, they, they don't go back there to go and do that. So, what we're going to see is that. Banking halls will not be restricted to only those transactions that people are unable to do on their electronic platform. So even after COVID, we're not likely to uh, see any significant reduction in the, in the volume of e transactions. It will continue to grow. Mm. And how important do you think this data is in the fight against corruption? Is it something the EFCC and other anti graft agencies uh, should consider? Very, very important. Uh, the, the reason is because electronic channels leave a track. So you can see as money is moving from one place to another, one account to another. And if you need to track or trace, you can trace. Those. That is totally different from a case of cash. Uh, cash can exchange and it becomes difficult to know what is going on in the midst of that. The major fraud that have been investigated across the world even including those ones um, for which Nigerians were involved, uh, people just sat on their computers and were able to track and investigate this, this fraud. Um, so it, it portends a very great support for uh, um, uh, integrity within the banking system and for the fight against uh, uh, frauds in the financial services uh, industry. Hmm. And on the flip side, how vigilant should we be in checking cybercrime and online fraud? It will help a great deal. Um, the the, the, the cybercrime represents a different complexion of uh, um, fraud that we're going to see as more people leave the traditional banking system onto the electronic platforms. So the risk that the banks are facing when people come into their banking or it's a bit different in complexion from what they're not going to face when people are doing most of their transactions on the electronic platform. Uh, but because of that, the banks are always, um, you know, getting ahead of the fraudster to ensure that the right level of security is in place that will guarantee 
the safety of funds, of, 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 of customer funds. And I'm also aware that the banks are not relying, they are not, they are not uh, uh, dropping their guards on this. Because as they are doing one thing, the people who are intended on teaching the system are also chasing up. So they will continue to improve on the security system to ensure that they maintain the confidence of the users in that platform. Because once the confidence of the users is lost, then they go back to the banking hall and we will have lost everything we gained over, over the period. Hmm. And if there's so much value in circulation right now, I'm talking about the uh, several uh, millions of naira being exchanged, you know, as the MBS just released. How do you then marry the the fact that there's so much money in circulation with forecasts from the IMF and other global uh, banking bodies about a, an impending recession in Nigeria? Uh, it, it has to do with the gap between the have and the have not in Nigeria. If you look at the trend with the um, bonds that were being offered for sale in Nigeria over the last few months, June, July, August, they were all heavily oversubscribed. 400% oversubscribed, 300% oversubscribed. That is the kind of oversubscription we're having in the system. The message from that is that there is so much money chasing so few investment instruments. So, and that takes us back to the question you asked. So if there is so much money, how come we have all these predictions about uh, uh, Nigeria being in crisis and all? It has to do with that gap. The fact that 5% uh, uh, of the people have so much of the money and a large percentage do not have enough to even put on their table is what is playing out here. So the fact that there's money in the system does not mean that the money is going around. So there is a whole lot of people who are not having a fair share of that huge money. And it is the duty of government to, as much as possible, try to see how this can be redistributed to ensure that the larger part of the society also have a benefit of the money that is in circulation. Mm. And uh, from an economic point of view, how, how would you uh, specifically, would you give like a specific suggestion to how the government can make sure that everybody gets a, a slice of the cake? Uh, yeah, the, the, the instruments are there um, that have been used over and over again. Uh, there are the, uh, the social investment schemes that are there to ensure that we pass money onto the people that have no money. There is the issue of in, the, in, in, in a season like this COVID season where people are losing jobs because their employers can no longer pay, that the government step into that space and, and support those employers to be able to stay in business and retain employment. Then government has to continue to also spend. So um, all those infrastructure projects that they plan to do, they have to do it. The 774,000 jobs, for example, that have been hanging for several months now, we need to execute it. These are the kind of things that ensure that spending is going on. Hmm. Once you have spending, it has a way of trickling down to everybody along the chain. If you take a construction site, for example, uh, it's not just the project managers and the, uh, uh, and the engineer that will make money from that. You also have the bricklayers, you have the carpenter, you have the woman who sells food to the construction workers, you have the transporters, everybody benefits from that. Okay. And those are the kind of things that help to stimulate the economy and make wealth, uh, you know, uh, uh, provide a platform for wealth creation across uh, every, every platform, every, every structure of society. Indeed, and thank you very much for your thoughts uh, on the news uh, this morning. My pleasure. Thanks a lot for having me.